To the members and friends of the Oklahoma Annual Conference, greetings. My name is Charlotte Gortney, and I'm the current chair of the Board of Pension and Health Benefits. Back in November, our board voted to increase the direct bill costs to local churches with full-time appointed clergy people, effective January 1, 2019. And since that announcement, we've had many questions, as you might imagine. I'm grateful for the questions because they've helped shape the explanation I'd like to give you over about the next 30 minutes. I know, 30 minutes is a long time. But friends, we didn't get here overnight, and there are several factors that contribute to the board's decision, so if you'll hang with me through this explanation, I think you'll understand a lot more about what brought us to this point of making the decisions we did as a board. As an aside, we have encountered several questions about our authority to make a unilateral decision without approval from CFNA or the annual conference or even the cabinet. Well, every year our board includes a statement in our annual report that is approved at annual conference, and the statement reads, the Conference Board of Pension and Health Benefits is authorized to make substantive changes in the health benefits plan between annual conference sessions, sessions when such changes are necessary to properly manage this plan. In my seven years on the board, we've never invoked this authority. We've also never been in a position where it appeared our plan might become insolvent. As I hope to explain, our board truly felt we were in an emergency situation and we couldn't wait until annual conference to act. Friends, you truly want it to be this way. You want the group bearing responsibility for administering our health insurance to be able to make decisions quickly. Employers reserve this right when managing their employees' health plan. In fact, I don't know of a single employer that would require the approval of almost a thousand delegates in order to change their plan structure. That being said, we fully understand that our decision impacts our whole annual conference and we want to stay in conversation with CFNA, local churches, the cabinet, and all those who are impacted by this decision. I will say this again at the end, but I am completely open to receiving questions, suggestions for improvement to our current plan, and I'm glad to come and visit with groups who need more information. Now, it's time to dig into the numbers and figure this out together. So thank you very much for spending your time uh, on this video. We have had so many questions like, why is our health insurance so expensive? Why are clergy required to participate when we could get cheaper coverage in other places? Why are we just now finding out about losses to the health insurance program if they've been going on for four years? And what about my church? They can't afford to pay the increase. What happens to them and to me? Who makes decisions about this anyway? And how can I influence them? Well, the last question is an easy one to answer. So let's talk about it. Who makes decisions about this anyway? It's the Board of Pension and Health Benefits, which is composed of laity and clergy from across our annual conference. This board is charged with the oversight of both pension and health benefits. The board welcomes your questions and feedback, as well as your suggestions for improving our current benefit structure. Member names and contact information will be listed on the conference website under the benefits section in case you would like to contact any member of the board. Many of you have this question. So why is our health insurance so expensive? I don't know that I can answer that question directly, but I will try to explain how our health insurance works. We are self-insured, which means that the annual conference pays every claim that our participants generate through accessing health care. The cost of our insurance is directly the result of the cost of our claims. At the end of each year, we can examine our overall revenue and our overall expenses and see how we did. Some years, we receive more money than we spend, and we get to keep the surplus, which increases our cash reserves for the years when the math works in the other direction. The benefit of being self-insured is that ability to keep surpluses. But the liability of being self-insured is that group claims can sometimes be rather volatile, and it can quickly eat away at reserve funds. But to clearly state, the Board of Pension and Health Benefits has sole authority to structure the plan, set the rates, decide how the program will run. No outside entity, and certainly no insurance company, tells us how to run our plan because we are self-insured. Now, let's take a look at the most recent year of claims data that we have, which is 2018. Not all of the claims are in yet for the year 
So this information is accurate up through November of last year. Our claims expense, which would be our medical and prescription claims, make up uh, $7 million of our expense last year. In addition, we had $47,000 of claims that were in excess of the premiums paid for the dental and the vision programs, which is a loss that must be covered by other plan revenue. The remaining $700,000 or so uh, of what we spent last year would be considered administrative costs. So I want to take a moment to break those down. The largest amount, which is $188,000, is a premium we pay to insure our plan against high dollar claims. It's also called stop loss insurance. Currently, our deductible is $150,000. So we are reimbursed for amounts over $150,000 the plan spends on any one claimant. In 2018, we received $28,748 in reimbursements from our stop loss insurance, meaning a pretty good loss of income to the plan when you consider what we paid for the premium and what we received in reimbursements. It's a high cost to the plan to pay this premium, but it's necessary to operate with our low reserves because if we had a claimant that reached medical claims of $500,000, for example, it could wipe out our reserves very quickly. The second largest amount, $133,000, is the fee we pay to rent the Blue Cross Blue Shield network. This access is what makes our plan work. There's no way the conference can negotiate agreements with providers all across the state to make sure that you get access health care. So we rent this access through Blue Cross Blue Shield. The other amounts include the fee we pay to our prescription plan to use their network, the life insurance policy the conference provides for all active full-time clergy, our wellness program, which is known to you as Vivere or Simply Well, the fee for our consultant who helps us structure the plan, the administrative costs for running this program through the conference office. As you look at the chart, you'll see that in terms of the overall spend of the plan, those are fairly small amounts. The reality of our plan expense is that we are high utilizers. For example, a few years ago, we contracted with Kempton Premier Providers as a bolt-on to our current plan. Since Kempton could provide services we were already accessing through Blue Cross Blue Shield Network at a fraction of the cost, we were projecting that our claims expense in the Blue Cross Network would go down. Instead, what has happened is that our claims expense with Blue Cross have continued to increase, and so has our cost through Kempton. Most likely, our participants are choosing to access Kempton for elective procedures since there's no out-of-pocket costs when you use Kempton, and these procedures are ones that they might not have accessed with Blue Cross Blue Shield because they would have had to meet their deductible before the plan would pay. We don't really know what's happening. We just know that the overall spend of the plan is going up. So at the end of the day, the cost of our health insurance is directly related to our claims expense. Many have asked, so why didn't we see the losses sooner? Which is a great question. I mean, these losses have been going on for four years, and why are we just now finding out about it? Again, it's a legitimate question. And as the chair of the board, I shoulder this responsibility most clearly. I want to offer to you an explanation that does not excuse our oversight at all, but it might be a caution to us about the lengthy, lengthy timelines of our approval process. So we approve the plan structure at annual conference each year to take effect the following January. That means that we have to set the plan structure, or the rates, really, mid-March. That's not even a full first quarter of claims data for the year prior to the new rates taking effect. By comparison, most companies set their rates in October with almost three quarters of claims data. Realistically, what it means is that the rates that we set are set with claims data that is two years old. That doesn't allow us to correct quickly. As a board, we should have seen the projections of our plan losses in the spring of 2017, but we didn't see them until the spring of 2018. That's a huge miss, but it is not a four-year miss. Another question that comes up at this point. So my church's portion of the direct bill kept increasing, and now you tell me that the church hasn't seen an increase in five years. How can that be? Well, we need to look at, at the direct bill rollout. In 2013, 
the annual conference voted to move away from funding the church portion of uh, the active health care costs through an apportionment to billing the churches a per-clergy amount. As an annual conference, we decided to roll this out over four years. In 2014, 25% of the cost was direct billed to the church and the remaining 75% was covered through an apportionment line item. In 2015, the amount was split 50-50. In 2016, the direct bill covered 75% of the cost, and in 2017, the churches fall, saw, first saw the complete amount being direct billed to them. Each year, the apportionment line item decreased a subsequent amount to reflect the increase in the direct bill. Most churches thought their cost for health care was going up during those four years, 2014 to 2017, because the overall apportionments in that period of time did not go down by the same amount. But from the plan's perspective, it was revenue neutral. The plan was not seeing any more revenue during those four years because that direct bill amount and the amount being paid through the apportionment line item was the same. In 2017, the Board of Pension and Health Benefits noted that we had seen two years of subsequent losses at that point. 2015 and 2016. We were hesitant to raise the direct bill amount to local churches because the perception was that it had already been increasing 25% a year. So we held the line at that point, and it was a mistake. By the end of 2017, we could see that we were going to suffer another year of losses. In the spring of 2018, we recommended an increase in premiums to the participants. In dollar amounts, those with families on the plan saw the largest amount of increase. In percentages, single participants saw the largest increase. These new premiums took effect a few weeks ago on January 1st, 2019. In our spring meeting of 2018, the board didn't even consider an increase to the direct bill amount because we wanted to honor the request to hold the line on asks of the local church that was being made of every ministry in the annual conference at that point. And just to note, during, during the five years since moving to the direct bill, premiums for clergy have increased three times. The overall contributions from the churches have not increased once. So in our fall 2018 meeting, uh, back in November, the board looked at the pie chart that you saw a little earlier, except we looked at that same chart for the years 2015, 16, 17, and what was at that point year-to-date 2018. And this is what we saw. In 2015, the plan lost $996,538, which lowered our cash reserves to just over $6 million. In 2016, the plan lost $1.77 million, lowering our cash reserves to just over $4 million. In 2017, the plan lost just under $1 million and lowered our cash reserves to right at $3 million. Where we were sitting uh, in November of 2018, we expected that we might lose up to $1.7 million in the plan, which would leave our reserves at the beginning of 2019 at $1.3 million. And we projected, even with the increase in premiums in 2019, that we might lose $800,000. We felt that without immediate action to raise plan revenue, our plan might be in a position of insolvency before year-end 2019, which means we would be unable to pay claims, which would mean that almost 700 participants and their families would be uninsured through no fault of their own. This seemed an unacceptable outcome to the board, so we recommended that the direct bill amount to the local church increase by $200 a month as of January 1, and then an additional increase of $200 a month as of July 1. And many of you have said, we simply can't keep absorbing cost increases like this. What is the Board of Pensions and Health Benefits doing to curb costs and eliminate these rate hikes? Well, at our fall meeting, it was clear to everyone on the board that we can no longer be self-insured. The volatility in claims cost is too risky, and we don't have enough reserves to sustain a viable program. At that point, we really have two options. We can move to a fully insured plan so that an insurer 
is carrying the risk, the liability of our plan, or we can get out of health insurance, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those options. We did vote to proceed with a fully insured plan as of 2020. This plan will come to annual conference 2019 for approval, uh, so it'll be in a few months here at, in May. And if the annual conference approves our recommendation, we'll make the switch January 1, 2020. Beyond that, it's important to understand that health insurance costs continue to increase across the nation at an alarming rate. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures in 2018, premiums rose 5% for employer-based family coverage and 3% for single coverage. The average amount of covering a family on an employer-based program, not on the exchange, was $19,616 a year. If you want to break that down to a monthly cost, $1,643.66 a month. The average amount for a single participant on an employer-based program per year was $6,896. So while it seems that our health insurance is exorbitantly expensive, it's really not that far off from the national trends. The bottom line is health insurance is incredibly expensive, and the trends are that the cost is only going to get higher. One thing that's different for us than a traditional employer-based plan is that as an employee, most of the time people consider the cost of their insurance uh, to be what their premiums reflect, and they really don't ever pay attention to the amount that their employer is paying on their behalf for their insurance. Well, as a clergy person, I can tell you that I'm concerned about my premium, but I'm also concerned about the portion that my church pays, and so we tend to think the cost for our health insurance is higher because we have to manage both of those parts of the cost. Uh, whereas in an employer-based plan, when you hear somebody talk about their premium and it's so much lower, it's probably because their employer is paying a much larger portion of their cost. So many of you have asked, why can't we just get out of the health insurance business altogether and allow people to find their own coverage? Well, the board is seriously considering this option as well. We're doing research into that uh, right now. We're required by the Book of Discipline to provide either a group health plan or funding for clergy health care. So we can't get out of paying for health care altogether. It bears noting that while clergy are not considered employees by the federal government, lay employees are in a different category. And so for churches that are large enough that they must provide coverage and are currently doing that through the conference plan, they would have to underwrite their own plans. And so there are some considerations outside of just clergy health coverage when the board has to talk about the structure of our plan. So let's just take the amount of the increased direct bill when it's fully implemented, uh, which won't be next year, would be 2020. The direct bill amount would be $11,760 per year per clergy. So just using that as a guide, our preliminary research into the cost of coverage on the exchange indicates that younger clergy, we used an average age of 40, will likely save money in premium costs. That would allow them to pocket a good portion of that cash stipend. However, older clergy are going to find it hard to purchase coverage on the exchange for this price. We used an average age of 60, and we found it difficult to find plans for that age group that would come within that range of $11,760 a year. In addition, uh, the cost for buying coverage on the exchange for those living in rural areas means that they have to pay higher premiums in order to access care that is close to them. We already know that a cash stipend would be taxable income to clergy. Most clergy in Oklahoma, even those making the minimum salary, make too much money to qualify for tax credits to offset those health care costs. Even though they would be able to deduct it on income tax, they would still have to pay SECA taxes on it. So effectively, what that means is that any cash stipend that a church would pay to their clergy to purchase health insurance would be reduced by 15% immediately. We anticipate that this approach would also drastically stratify our clergy socioeconomically. For instance, some of our clergy would be eligible for coverage under their spouse's insurance and they would have very little out-of-pocket expense for health insurance, which would allow them to, in effect, receive a very large salary increase. Other clergy, those close to 60 years of age, 
those with families, etc., they would have to use all of the stipend, and then they would have considerable out-of-pocket expense in order to purchase coverage on the exchange. With clergy choosing their own plans, coverage levels would vary widely, with some clergy having only catastrophic coverage and others having extreme coverage. Many of our clergy are of an age and health condition that they're going to find it very expensive on the exchange. And if the push from the president's administration to eliminate the requirement to cover pre-existing conditions is approved, it might be that many of our clergy would be ineligible for coverage on the exchange. So you can see, it's rather complicated, but it might be, all things considered, a better option to ask the local churches to pay a cash stipend to their clergy person, and then just let each person make his or her own decision about coverage. If that is the case, the board is fully prepared to consider this option. But we do try to take the long view and consider all possible outcomes. At the board table, this means that what is financially advantageous in the short run, or to a few individuals, or to a few local churches, is not usually our first recommendation. Then we come to this question. Why are clergy required to participate? Well, yes, every full-time appointed clergy is required to participate. And the short answer is that if clergy could opt out of our program, we wouldn't have enough of a group to make the program work. The longer answer is that we covenant to care for one another as clergy. And this is one of the ways it gets tangibly lived out. Those with larger health expenses are protected by those with smaller health expenses, paying more than their fair share. Then there has been this question, what about my church? They can't afford the, the increase. What happens to them and to me? So let's talk for a moment about the impact to the local church. The question about the health and vitality of our local churches has been at the forefront of the board's conversations, I can promise you. So we want to clearly address this question about the impact that this decision has on the local church that you serve or, or are a part of. First, if you're listening to this and you're a clergy person, Please understand and appreciate how expensive it is for the church you serve to have you on staff. Outside of the salary they provide for you, they're required to pay into the pension plan on your behalf, which requires a payment generally in the neighborhood of 12% of your salary on top of what they already give you for your salary. Then they either must provide you a parsonage or a housing allowance equal to the fair market value of the parsonage in your location. And then they also must cover this employer portion of your health insurance. So when the church you serve is in decline, these kinds of fixed costs, they place an extraordinary strain on already tight budgets. Many of you, if you're clergy, you understand that one increase in a property insurance premium or utility rate hike, it could tip the scales for your local church. Our board, in hindsight, did the local church no favors by not increasing the overall amount of the church contributions during those four years that we were moving from the apportionment to direct bill. We were basically asking the local churches to come up with five years of increase, giving them only two months notice. That is unfair, and the board so wishes we could go back a few years and have those conversations again, knowing what we know now, but we can't do that. I would tell you it wouldn't change the outcome of where we find ourselves, but we could have incorporated that over a matter of five years instead of letting you know that and giving you two months notice. Third, if this increase means that your church can no longer afford a full-time appointed clergy, you need to be in conversation with your district superintendent immediately. If the church cannot pay the increased direct bill amount, it could mean that you cannot be appointed there as a full-time clergy person. So these conversations need to be happening quickly. Then there is one more question that we all need to ask. So how do the retiree health care costs affect the conversation about active health care costs? Well, there is really only one, form, uh, one fund to absorb any costs that are not funded by revenues to either the retiree or active health care plans. This fund is called the Group Insurance Fund. Currently, retirees that are Medicare eligible, those 65 and older, must enroll in Medicare. They can then particip participate in on a specialized exchange to purchase both supplemental and prescri prescription drug coverage. 
The annual conference funds an HRA contribution of up to $200 a month for each retiree and up to an additional $200 a month for their spouse. For most retirees, this contribution to their HRA gives them $4,800 annually to purchase extra coverage outside of what is provided by Medicare. This contribution that we make to their HRAs is funded by the apportionment line item, Retiree Health Insurance. In addition to this monthly contribution to the retiree HRAs, this line item funds several other costs, like the cost for retirees or their spouses who are not yet 65. Those persons still have to be carried on our plan because they're not Medicare eligible, but the premiums that we ask them to pay don't even come close to covering that cost. In addition, the cost of the medical screens at annual conference for retirees and the cost of a life insurance policy that the conference pays for all retirees. It's important to remember that retirees do not have a salary paying unit to contribute to the cost of their health insurance the way active full-time appointed clergy do. The board's decision has been to fund these costs through an apportionment instead of increasing the direct bill amount to each local church to cover it. This apportionment has been set at $1.5 million for the last several years. The cost of those HRA contributions I mentioned has averaged about $1.1 million over the last few years. Now that's left some room for funding those other costs I mentioned. However, for the first time, the cost of funding the HRA for retirees will exceed $1.5 million in 2018. The overage will come from the group insurance fund, which is our cash reserves to fund both the active and retiree health programs. Last year, the Board of Pension and Health Benefits brought a proposal to annual conference recommending a decrease to this HRA contribution amount for future retirees. Since we take the long view, we could see that the number of retirements will dramatically increase over the next 10 years, and it is unlikely that a local church, particularly our local churches in decline, can continue to fund an increasing apportionment line to help with those HRA costs. The annual conference defeated this proposal and voted to keep the HRA stipend at $200 a month or $400 a month for a couple. In addition, when the annual conference passed the budget, we voted to reduce this line item from $1.5 million to $1.3 million in 2019. Knowing that we exceeded $1.5 million in 2018 just to fund the HRA contributions, we will certainly exceed the amount collected in this apportionment for 2019. The shortfall in expense versus revenue will have to come from the group insurance fund, which will deplete our reserves at an even more rapid rate than just covering the 2018 losses in the active health insurance program. So, the last question, where do we go from here? Well, I'm not sure I have a firm answer to that yet, but I do want to offer you a few closing reflections. As the chair of the Board of Pension and Health Benefits, I, I want you to know I want straight answers. I want to know what our real costs are, and I want to know when we're going to run out of reserves. I feel that particularly as of the spring 2017, I'm sorry, the spring of 2018, our conference staff has been able to provide us this information in ways that we weren't previously seeing it. Even last spring, we knew that we would have to increase premium costs for participants, and we knew that we could no longer afford the HRA subsidies we're providing for our retirees. We also knew that taking a one-year break from increasing the past service rate, which affects the payout to retirees uh, from the pre-82 plan, that would give us a year to deal with some of the other losses we were facing. We brought two recommendations to the annual conference floor from the Board of Pension and Health Benefits. Both of them dealt with cutting benefits to retirees in order to curb costs. One passed, the other failed. We also increased premium costs to participants in the active plan, which was approved by vote on the consent agenda. So both the retirees and the active clergy had to take a financial hit last year. Unfortunately, it's not enough to make the ends meet. As the lead pastor in a local church, I feel the squeeze of increased conference asks of the congregation I serve. We already had our budget in place. We had passed pastor salaries at charge conference. When the board implemented the increase in direct bill for January 1, 2019, 
I joined the rest of my colleagues in trying to rearrange our budget and make room for those increased costs. The laity in my congregation were not nearly as surprised by this increase as I was. They reiterated to me that their businesses and their employers have faced well over 6% increase in health care costs year over year for a long time. There's probably a lot more that could be said in explanation of the board's decision to raise the direct bill amount for health insurance costs, but this video is already long enough. Our board wants to be transparent, wants to be transparent with the conference regarding our decisions. So if you still have questions, I will take whatever time is needed to walk anyone through our decision-making matrix or to listen to alternative proposals about what else we might do to provide access to health care for those who serve our annual conference. I've put my contact information there on the screen for you, both my email and my cell phone, and I hope that you will feel free to contact me with further questions or suggestions. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.